Good night. Andrew Mahara here. Are all people that find themselves in a relationship or having been in a relationship, significant other, with somebody with borderline personality disorder, are all people codependent? I talk a lot about codependency as relates to a plethora of people who end up in relationships to people with BPD or with BPD. Don't know that at the time until after and in the process of trying to survive the BPD relationship breakup. Not all people that get into a relationship with somebody with BPD are codependent because most people or a lot of people are codependent. How many people aren't either codependent or as I'm going to talk about miscounterdependent? Or people with narcissistic personality disorder often get in relationships with people with borderline personality disorder and vice versa. Well, the key thing is not too many people with a secure attachment style from childhood, A, exist in the world today, but B, they don't tend to be the people that get into these relationship situations and types. So it's not just people with codependency, it's maybe not as often, but people with counter dependency. What is counter dependency? Well, counter dependency is a position. It goes to attachment style and an attitude. So thoughts create emotions, create actions. So for the counter dependent person, the pain of childhood and whatever that might mean, the unmet needs or not being seen or heard that can create codependency in many can create its opposite counter dependency and unlike codependency at the core of counter dependency is a mindset and often an unconscious belief that people act upon that is avoidant that is i don't need anybody i don't want to need anybody and it's a very defensive and protective mindset that isn't often in people's conscious awareness until people get into a process of healing recovery. Most people are not aware of this in their emotional landscape consciously when they are seeking to be in a relationship and trying to make a relationship work with somebody with borderline personality disorder or for that matter, narcissistic personality disorder. Codependency is, consists of ingrained patterns where people have these repetition compulsion cycles to get to self-worth from pleasing others. But the lesser known opposite of codependency is counterdependency. And it can be just as much of a problem in people's lives in, and in relationships as codependency. And sometimes a person can switch from one extreme to the other in a relationship. So going from codependency to being counterdependent after months or years of having been codependent. Which So counter-dependency can also be a reactionary protective thing or stance or attitude, way of living one's life that's very protective, which can be a way of, basically, yeah, counter-dependency can just be a way, for some people with codependency, they end up just doing, going to the opposite extreme. So if you've had a lot of failed relationships, or for anyone who has, and maybe with predominantly cluster B individuals, borderline or narcissistic personality disorder individuals. And so a lot of people with codependency are going to sink more deeply into the codependency and the repetition compulsion cycles of those ingrained patterns from childhood. But some can end up at the other extreme, which is just counterdependent. I don't need anybody. And it's not that people don't want to have relationships or don't want to be seen or heard or loved, but it's the pain and often from family of origin and childhood that isn't in one's consciousness that drives both codependency and its opposite, counterdependency. So what is counterdependency? It could be said that it's a fancy way of saying fear of intimacy. So people that have counterdependency have a dread of ever depending on or needing anyone, at the heart of which is an inability to trust. And this comes from woundedness in childhood in various different ways for many different people. If there was a mantra that all counterdependents have, it would probably go something like, I don't need anyone. What are the signs of counterdependency? 
Counter-dependents often come across as vibrant, life-of-the-party kind of people, or the kind of person that has a lot of friends and relationships. The difference is that those relationships will not be deep or trusting and might not last. One of the main signs of counter-dependency is an inability to have connected and authentic relationships. So the, co- the counter-dependent can also end up with a borderline or a narcissist often. So people with counter-dependency seem good at relating, but then having a point or a wall where it stops. They feel trapped in relationships. They push people away or going cold without warning in counter-dependency. Fear of abandonment or rejection. So it's basically the abandon or reject first in counter-dependency, where with codependency, it's people really don't know how to abandon other or reject other because they're a li- in a different way, more ensconced in their own concern about being rejected or abandoned. So a less protected place in codependency of fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, and fear of intimacy than those with counterdependency. People with counterdependency have a tendency to date needy overgivers or codependents or often end up in relationships with people with borderline personality disorder, many of whom have a lot of codependency as well, and a lot of neediness, and then will come across in such a way, the too-good-to-be-true way, to the counterdependent, as they do also to the codependent in the beginning. And people that are counterdependent might have different personalities for different people to avoid being seen, are always busy, might even overwork, and, and, the, and they're needing to avoid intimacy and might not be consciously aware of that. Anxiety and fear arising in, if relationships get too deep happens often for people with counterdependency, can make all touch into something sexual to avoid emotional things like tenderness. People with counterdependency might date people they aren't a good match with. So that could be BPD, NPD, or codependent, really. And they don't really fall in love. And they keep people they're a good match for as only friends, or that they might be a good match for. And also, counterdependents, instead of asking for support in a relationship, are prone to complaining and sulking, backing up, distancing, and people with counterdependency seek to avoid anyone getting close enough they are tempted to depend on. So communication becomes tempered by lack of trust, and it manifests like in terms of people with counterdependency often will walk away uh, from or avoid conflict, or need, they need to be right. They don't trust others' motives, but instead often second-guess people. A constant sense that others always let them down, and people who are counterdependent rarely, if ever, ask for help. Then there is the inner world of the counterdependent. With a childhood that often left them fending for themselves, at least emotionally, and perhaps even more than that. What could have caused that in childhood? Well, being oversensitive to criticism of others, even as they often criticize, often hard on themselves, uh, counterdependents, it's pretty accurate to say they hate making mistakes. So they're kind of perfectionist or driven to be perfectionistic, suffer from an inner soundtrack of intense self-criticism. So very inflamed internal, you know, inner critic. They don't relax easily. They can experience shame if they feel needy, see vulnerability as a weakness, secretly suffer feelings of loneliness and emptiness, and might have difficulty remembering childhood which is interesting because as I've been working with people for 32 years, I definitely see in counterdependence much more difficulty remembering childhood than in people with codependency. So related mental health conditions to counterdependency. Why is counterdependency such a big deal? Well, it can cause intense and often well-hidden feelings of loneliness that can spiral into depression and anxiety. And if it isn't the loneliness that causes severe low moods, it's often the hidden low self-esteem that counterdependents suffer from 
which is one of the leading pathways to major depressive episodes. There's a possibility if people are counterdependent enough that they can develop grandiosity or even narcissistic personality disorder, but this wouldn't happen like later in life. It would, the underpinnings would already be there from childhood. Clinging to the notion that you don't need others or that others are not good enough to understand you can mean you develop an inflated sense of being superior, which taken too far can mean that people can lose empathy for others entirely. How or what do counterdependent people think? What do the thoughts of a counterdependent sound like then? And these are also negative core beliefs, not just thoughts. I don't need anyone. Don't let them too close, they'll just disappoint you. I'd rather be successful than have a relationship anyway. Love is overrated. I don't need it. People just take, take, take and leave me drained. It's not worth it. I'm too good for him or her anyway. Don't let your guard down or they'll just hurt you. He, she could never handle me. Nobody can understand me. They aren't smart enough. And those are all protective things that are happening inside a counterdependent that really are negative core beliefs. So whether those thoughts are actually consciously had or not, for some people, maybe some of them, and maybe there's a few that are often on the minds of people, like love is over overrated or I don't need a relationship. Um, and people often become, there's many, many different ways people with counterdependency can go, but many counterdependents are very successful in work and business life, career, and often they are entrepreneurs. And because, because again, they're going to lead the path, lead the way and not need anybody else. And so they can really often be workaholics. So is there a connection between codependency and counterdependency? Well, a codependent appears to be the opposite of a counterdependent person. They believe that they need another's attention to have any self-worth and tend to manipulate by their smothering attentions to their partner. And although it might sound like the last person a counterdependent would choose to be involved with, it's actually a very common match. A counterdependent person will initially be attracted to the codependent's apparent show of understanding and warmth. Same can be said of a counterdependent being attracted to the all too good idealizing presentation of somebody with borderline personality disorder. So, in the case where a codependent and a counterdependent may be in a relationship together, underneath the counterdependent person's belief they don't need anyone is a deep sense to finally be able or of wanting to finally be able to let their guard down and fully trust and love another. Because codependency and counterdependency both revolve around needing others, whether that is wanting the other or avoiding the other, it's not uncommon for partners in a, quote, dependency based, unquote, relationship to switch roles. So, if you relate to this, you might ask the question, why am I counterdependent? Counterdependency often develops as an adult from the result of what happens in your childhood. And this could be childhood, adverse experience, something might have happened that instilled a belief in you that others can't be trusted. Perhaps you really couldn't trust your parents, which is a very wounding thing for any child to any degree. Maybe they weren't emotionally available. And so it's dangerous to need anyone because it probably wasn't so safe in childhood to need one or both parents, depending on what people's parents were really like. This might have been a parent leaving or um, a person close to someone passing away, adverse experience, or something happening to the family that was very difficult to cope with and maybe as a child, someone doesn't get any help in coping with whatever that might be about. Many different causes of woundedness in families of origin that many people today with counterdependency are still not consciously aware of those connectors. And that's, you know, I'm out here to work with you if I resonate with you on that. And the thing is that people with counterdependency make the process of helping them just a little bit more difficult generally because they don't want to need any help which is quite understandable, but that doesn't have to be a block to opening up, processing this, to be being able to find a way to become healthier and an independent person. 
Counterdependency could also arise from the kind of parenting you received from your main caregiver during the beginnings of childhood. And this goes to attachment. The connection that a child forms with the caregiver, which is usually mother, but the first few months and years of life is so very important. Determining how they will relate to the world and others in the future. Attachment theory sees a healthy attachment where parents are sensitive to the needs of their child, meaning that the child is likely to grow up able to manage their emotion, be confident in themselves, and handle relationships well. But your parental figure was not emotionally available, was unreliable, or unresponsive to your needs, pushed you to be more independent than a child should ever have to be, or even was dangerous to you, subjecting you to emotional or physical adverse experience when then you will develop what is known as avoidant or anxious attachment one or the other even though a child should be able to need a parent parental figure a child in such a situation will suppress his or her reliance on the caregiver and not turn to the parent when upset suffering or needing comfort so in other words you decide at a very young age because you really don't have a choice. It's not like an informed, rational choice. It's a defense that it's too dangerous to trust your caregiver and you work to not attach to them because it can feel like you're being subsumed. And so um, a child does this as a survival tactic and it might not help in the long run, but it does help to get through what you're going through in family of origin when you're growing up. And it helps people to avoid unwanted or unwarranted rejection or punishment. The problem is when you continue to use a survival tactic coming into adulthood and beyond, not allowing any dependency on others in order to keep yourself safe well into your adulthood without questioning or maybe being aware of the relevancy of this. When children are hurt and can't rely or on a parent or don't have emotional safety in family of origin or sometimes do but sometimes don't then this translates into becoming an adult who doesn't trust others to be there for them thinks they can take complete care of themselves without help and who might secretly be very lonely so really in psychological circles this one definition given to counter dependency is a refusal of attachment so what is it that a person who's counterdependent can aim for instead of remaining counterdependent. Well, a healthy person does not either need all of the time or never need people at, at other times. Rather, they understand what is called interdependency. So, whether one has codependency or counterdependency, the goal in healing and recovery journeys is to work through the family of origin issues, the early childhood moodiness, to Find your way to being an independent individual. Emotionally. And interdependency is when people can acknowledge that we can take care of ourselves and desire to be in charge of our lives, even as we allow ourselves to be interconnected with others and rely on them for some things. So what can you do if you think that you're a counterdependent? Well, definitely... Getting into a healing recovery process, I'm out here to work with people that resonate with me, is really the first step. So that you can find out what's made it hard for you to fully be yourself around others or engage in long-lasting supportive relationships. Counterdependency is pretty much in every way the opposite of codependency. And yet, people can shift from codependency to counterdependency. Not so much easily from counterdependency to codependency. And I just think it's something that people need to think more about because I've had many clients now and, and, and I've been working with clients over the years that do have counter-dependency. And so there are some differences in relationships with people with BPD, especially untreated, for those with counter-dependency because often the counter-dependent might end the relationship before they're ghosted or discarded. And not all people with BPD are going to ghost or discard you. So I think it's just really important for people to think about this because, like, I've had clients that just thought, and I've talked about codependency, and I think it's time that we really 
Also put in, in the mix, which is there for a lot of people, counter-dependency. And it's really important to get help and get into a healing recovery process with that as well because it's the opposite extreme from codependency, but either extreme has within it a plethora of defenses and a dysfunctional, unhealthy relationship to and with self that leads people to have various different kind of consequences in attempts to have relationships, leads people to be in relationships with people by and large that aren't healthier people. So that means often people with BPD or NPD. And then, as I'll say more about, it can be that two people get in a relationship and think they're both codependent or maybe maybe discover that and then wonder, well, can that work? Well, but often it's going to be one person who's counterdependent with a person who's codependent. And like then the ability for the counterdependent to sort of, or for the counterdependent and the codependent to kind of switch roles, it gets a little bit more complicated in how that actually emotionally unfolds because, well, I could describe it all day long. People have to first be aware and bring to their consciousness which I'm out here to help people do, and then we take the, uh, the, the next steps in helping you to heal, it, it first needs to be known and become aware to each person that counterdependency may well be the case, then each person has to become aware of that. And so, and I've seen the different patterns in working with a lot of clients between codependency and counterdependency. The dance between the counterdependent and the borderline is really in a different dynamic or set of dynamics than the codependent and the borderline. And yet, as different as those dynamics can be, there are overlapping similarities, but they just keep going to either extreme. And then you have the person with borderline personality disorder that may, instead of being codependent with the BPD, as I've talked about, people talk a lot about but don't, there can also be people with borderline personality disorder who have counter-dependency. There's not always codependency with BPD or even NPD, but it can be counter-dependency as well. And so to sum it up to say that it's just a fear of intimacy, well, it's also a fear of abandonment and a fear of rejection in counter-dependency. So is it in codependency. So is it in a different way to a different degree in borderline personality disorder. But the major difference is in all three, codependence, borderline personality disorder, and counterdependency, the biggest difference is how those defenses work. And what and, and it does go to the level of attachment as well. People with BPD having disorganized attachment, and if untreated, really, it means they can't attach. Um, in any healthy or consistent, congruent way whatsoever. And then for people with codependency, it's like that, it's like, a, it's almost like a super glue attachment, but it's insecure and it can be various other attachment styles as well. But, and then the counterdependent, you know, it's, it's the, I don't want to attach. So it's, it's really anxious avoidant, but more to the point, avoidant attachment. And all this is important but counterdependency and codependency on opposite sp sides of the spectrum, it's more important to understand more about that in your emotional landscape and where that comes from in your family of origin. And I do that work with clients. If you, you know, if I resonate with you, like I said, out here to work with you. But it's more important to do that work first. And then we kind of drill down in the process to the attachment styles, which becomes part of the inner child healing work and much more in the process. So counterdependency is the opposite of codependency, and yet some people can go from one extreme to the other. But often people with counterdependency do not remember as much about their childhoods, if they have many memories at all, as people with codependency. And so don't forget, people with BPD can be codependent as well, but people with BPD can be counterdependent. And then that is a whole different presentation. That's why I'm saying all people with BPD aren't the same. And it's really important to realize that not all people with BPD are going to do the same things when the relationship ruptures, which is kind of inevitable between somebody with untreated BPD 
or not really significantly treated BPD, somebody with untreated codependency, somebody with untreated counterdependency. Because these are all impacting codependency and counterdependency impact mental health and well-being because there are blocks and defense mechanisms in the way and that dysfunctional relationship to him with self, as I've said, that really create a lot of loneliness and, and pain and suffering. And then the counterdependent handles it one way and, and not necessarily is aware of what they're doing. So they're almost working against their own in a different way than people with BPD, in a different way that people with codependency, counter, if you, people with counterdependency are working against what it is that they truly want, but there's so many de layers of defense built up around that. I mean, relationships are overrated. And, you know, oh, I've got my business and I'm successful in life, and so who needs that? And these kind of defensive statements and also negative core beliefs. And often people are living their lives, whether they have BPD, whether they have codependency or counterdependency, living their lives without the awareness of what's driving the way that they relate to other people. And it's different. Like I'm not saying people with counterdependency and codependency are exactly like people with borderline personality disorder. But, but in all three different categories and what that means or differences, there's a similarity that isn't maybe made known or isn't like acted out like people with BPD. But for people with counterdependency and people with codependency, it's still this, the defenses and the lack of being able to be fully your authentic self from woundedness in childhood is blocking what you actually want to have in your life, in a relationship, to be in love, to be close, to connect to people. Whether it's counterdependency or codependency, people are often not aware of what, what does that mean that you as a counterdependent or you as a codependent bring to a relationship and why either, even these two different extremes, counterdependency and codependency, often are going to meet with cluster B personality disordered individuals and get in relationships with them. And that goes into the dynamics of the recreation of certain aspects of woundedness in family of origin to the inner child. The inner child is, is always seeking unbeknownst and, and in the unconscious of codependence and counterdependence. Your wounded inner child is seeking a similar experience of chaos and what wounded you in the hope of reparation. But reparation only comes in the healing and recovery process that I work with clients you know, in that seeking of help and understanding more and doing this healing work of family of origin and inner child healing and other aspects of it too and understanding the defense mechanisms and how you may well feel as a counterdependent or a codependent that you know who you are but, but you don't know who you are as much as you might think you do. And that doesn't, then again, the different differentiation again between people with BPD who really don't know who they are pretty much at all. And codependents and counterdependents can know a lot about self, but there's still something missing there. And then that will continue to create on one extreme or the other, the counterdependent side or the codependent side will continue to create a lot of emotional difficulty in two kind of opposing ways. That means people aren't really getting to live their best life and people don't know how to be entirely authentically themselves and be able to relate to others interdependently, which is healthy relationships involve respect and of course, um, love, healthy love, but they do, and and they also require independence. So interdependency, and I don't think enough is spoken about about what is a healthy relationship versus what are these very unhealthy relationships and unhealthy bonds all about. So the counterdependent gets into this dynamic in a different way with cluster bees than the codependent, and yet. 
if we really look at all the dynamics and pull them apart, they might look different, but they're still coming from similar places inside with different defenses. So that's just a little bit about counterdependency. If you resonate with that and you resonate with me, I'm out here to work with you on that. And otherwise, I hope that you found, uh, or regardless, I hope that you found this, in, you know, informative and somewhat interesting. And I will be talking much more about this. And the dynamics are such that, you know, people think that they can listen to podcasts or watch videos or read books and really create change. But the reality is that the counterdependent, like the codependent, is going to be so focused on the logic of what they're experiencing, because in in both cases, the counterdependent and the codependent are just not aware enough of their own emotional landscape due to the very nature of the needed defenses that were developed, maladaptive defenses as well, but not to the degree of BPD, that are developed by people with counterdependency or codependency in childhood and carried forward into adulthood and not not usually in the conscious awareness of people with counterdependency or codependency until unless you meet with an extremely usually it's a person with BPD could be a narcissist but until that you know agony of a BPD relationship breakup which is unlike any other relationship breakup it's even unlike a breakup with a narcissist i'm not saying it's easier or less painful and the dynamics are just very different and it's the counterdependent person not understanding themselves and what's happening for them in the emotional landscape and and the same with the codependent because again logic can be quite a defense mechanism to what's happening to people emotionally in adulthood so i hope that was helpful